brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that shares your values. More information is available at CharityMobile.com. On this Sunday, I have for you a couple of short reflections from Plinio Correa de Oliveira. He was a Brazilian intellectual journalist and leader of the traditionalist Catholic movement early in the life of the movement. He passed away nearly 30 years ago, and he had a lot to say. As you might expect, a leader of the early traditionalist movement in the church would. Here I have two short reflections. The first of the two is the longer. It is about an experience he had as a boy with Our Lady, and it really instructs us about the love of Our Lady and how Our Lady leads us to her son, that there is no real devotion. There is no worship of her son without devotion to Our Lady. Being devoted to Our Lady is essential to the worship of the Son. This is something controversial for the non-Catholics who might hear this, but that is a rather basic core Catholic teaching that goes back millennia. The second is a very short reflection on the Holy Rosary and how it is a powerful tool for our time for combating heresy. It's especially pertinent. He wrote this during the Second Vatican Council. I want you to think about what probably prompted him to write that. Without further ado, Plinio Correa de Oliveira. Under the Merciful Eyes of Mary by Plinio Correa de Oliveira. Trying to explain the essence of my devotion to Our Lady, I recently found an image that, although very simple, expresses my thought well. Let us imagine a well-formed polyhedron. If its faces are triangular, looking at one of them, in some sense we can see the others, for they are all triangle-shaped. So it is with the Mother of God, whose perfection is supereminent, and to whom the Church renders the cultus of hyperdulia. When we consider one of her sublime qualities, we see that she has an equally high degree, all the other virtues of which a human creature is capable. For example, knowing her faith. One understands her hope and her charity. Seeing one side of the polyhedron, one can intuit how the others are and their dimensions. If a polyhedron is not exactly like this according to ge geometry, at least the image can serve as a metaphor. What first touched me most in Our Lady was not so much her virginal and majestic holiness, but the compassion with which she looks upon those who are not holy, hearing them with pity and answering them generously. Her mercy, in short, has the same dimensions as her other qualities. In other words, it is an inexhaustible mercy of great clemency and patience, prompt to help at any moment in an unimaginable way without ever letting out a sigh of fatigue, exhaustion, or impatience. She is always ready not only to reiterate her goodness, but to surpass herself, so that when such mercy is shown, even if it is poorly received, another even greater follows. It is as if our abyss attracts her light. And the more we flee from her, the further she extends to us the graces she has obtained, casting light in our direction. How did I come to realize this? As a boy, having gone to the Church of the Heart of Jesus and taking notice for the first time of the statue of Our Lady Help of Christians, I was not favored by any vision, ecstasy, or revelation, but I felt touched as if the image were looking at me, and I had a kind of personal knowledge of this unfathomable goodness that totally enveloped me. Even if I wanted to run away or reject her, she would hold me affectionately and say, My son, come back, here I am. And this made me understand the depth of that mercy. First of all, I became calm for the rest of my life. In fact, no matter how great our problems were, if we are enveloped in this mercy, we can rest. Because when someone is not brutally insensitive and turns to the Virgin Mary, she eventually resolves everything. And note, one of the things that most impressed me, in the ambiguity of a child's mentality, this was very clear to me was to understand that this was not a privilege for me alone, but it was her attitude towards everyone. With all the people who have ever existed, and with all, and will exist, all the sinners who are on the streets, in the houses, the streetcars, the vehicles, she is exactly like this. Many, however, reject her. Whenever I see people who are agitated and full of problems, 
I have great pity for them and ask myself, why can I not transmit to them a, a look like the one I received from Our Lady? They would be calm for the rest of their life. I cannot fully express what that grace was. When I pray that passage from the Magnificat, he has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. I always think this is very true, and it is accomplishes through Mary most holy. She is the insatiable mercy that does not fail, but that multiplies solicitously, kindly coming down to our stature, and, out of compassion, making herself even smaller than us, so as to accommodate us. In considering this mercy, the virginity of Mary Most Holy comes to mind, for these notions are, so to speak, contained with one another. If we know her mercy, we know her purity. It is, once again, the image of the polyhedron. She is pure, with an unspeakable degree of purity. Any chastity which she can be conceived is nothing as compared with her purity, characterized not only by the absence of the least inclination to evil, but by an upspringing of soul aimed directly and exclusively at God, without the least attachment to anyone or anything else. It is a total elan of an impetus, integrity, and desire for the absolute which is immeasurable. The purity of Our Lady compared to that of other people is like the whiteness of snow compared to coal. And from my perspective, purity comes together with the concept of fortitude, which does not simply mean that nothing can break it. It is something else. And in face of what the Mother of God decides, in her purity, the rest of the world must bend to the power of her will. It is an impetus and a resolution without the possibility of resistance from anyone or anything. It is a sovereignty and dominion of such a magnitude that there are no words to express it. Today we often hear of shells and other weapons. In reality, they are simply harmless and ridiculous pop guns compared to an act of will, a preference of the Blessed Virgin. In turn, this fortitude, mercy, and purity bring to mind her lucid and adamantine wisdom, arranging everything, never having the least doubt, but only certainties. In other words, she has knowledge of all things, as well as their interrelationships, and penetrates into the depths of every being. The universe is so enormous. The fact that Our Lady understands the order of the universe and its apex once again allows us to glimpse the immensity of her purity, fortitude, and mercy. These are the virtues that, for the moment, most call my attention, when I remember the look of Our Lady help of Christians in the Church of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. One might ask, you received this when you were 11 or 12 years of age, and you never experienced anything similar afterwards. This grace was given to me in such a way that it remained like a shining light for my whole life. I feel it happened yesterday. It is as if the Blessed Virgin said to me, My son, I love you, and I declared, My mother, I am thine. Someone might ask, But where did you put our Lord Jesus Christ in these considerations? I reply, In everything. It is the idea that St. Louis-Marie de Grignon de Montfort develops extensively. Our Lady is the cloister, the oratory, the sacred tabernacle where the Redeemer is, and the closer we are to her, the closer we will be to her divine Son. Imagine Our Lady at the time when the child Jesus was being formed within her virginal body by the action of the Holy Spirit, and someone were to want to adore the Messiah apart from her. This would be absurd. It would not make sense. I know that I will be more united to our Lord the more I am united to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Naturally, it follows that my devotion to him passes through her. I believe, I hope at least, that even on those occasions when I am most tired, when I make reference to the adoration due to our Lord, I soon afterwards speak of his virginal mother. It is systematic. It could be said, but you often you talk about her without referring to him. Yes, because he is infinitely greater than she. Thus, in speaking of her, he is included implicitly. But when talking about him, she is not implicitly included. Therefore, like it or not, with the help of Our Lady, I will do this until I die. A timely reflection from Plinio Correa de Oliveira on the love and mercy of Our Lady. But here he's about to tell you something else. He's going to make a pitch that many will find uncomfortable. It used to be that when we spoke of praying the rosary, it wasn't praying, you know, five decades a day. It was the full rosary, a day, 15 decades, not five. That was what was said when we meant when we pray the rosary. When someone prayed five rosaries, five decades of the rosary, that was generally considered the children's rosary. <laughs> that has become the standard rosary in our time. 
Plinio Correa de Oliveira has a short reflection on why we should consider praying the full 15 decades every day, and his attitude about it is rather simple. It's impossible, according to the saints and doctors of the church, to pray with devotion, even a single Hail Mary, without distraction. So bet more is better. I'll let him explain the rest. Devotion to the Holy Rosary by Plinio Correa de Oliveira originally written in 1964. As we all know, one great value of devotion to the Rosary is that it was revealed by Our Lady to St. Dominic as a means for reviving the faith in regions heavily devastated by the Albigensian heresy. Indeed, the general practice of the Rosary revived the faith. With this the Rosary came to be, in epics where there was true faith in the world, one of the classic Catholic devotions. This was to such a point that not only were images of Our Lady spread throughout the world, but also the practice of this devotion became common among the faithful. Moreover, the rosary hanging from the waist became an official part of the habits of many religious orders. Among a thousand things that can be said in this respect, I would like to emphasize exactly this connection between the origin of the rosary and the virtue of faith, between the rosary and the defeat of the heretics. The rosary had always been considered a most powerful weapon of, of the faith. We know that the virtue of faith is the root of all virtues. The other virtues must blossom from a lively faith, otherwise they are not authentic virtues. Therefore, we will not forge ahead cultivating other virtues while neglecting the faith. For us, who live a combative life in favor of orthodoxy and who consider the victory of orthodoxy and the counter-revolution in the world an ideal for our lives, this devotion speaks volumes. It is precisely because it establishes a link between our lives and devotion to Our Lady that this is so. Our Lady clearly appears here as the one who single-handedly smashed all heresies, as said in the liturgy and, to a great extent, they were smashed by the rosary. The rosary is a weapon of orthodoxy, a weapon of ultramontanism. It is a devotion through which we smash the roots of evil and heresy that we might have within us, and through which we defeat the heresy and evil in the fight they wage against us. Thus the rosary is a typical devotion for us, and it is for this reason that we insist so much on it. This is so true that one can only consider the life of a member of the group as being normal, upright, when, among other things, he prays the full rosary every day. It does not make sense for someone to say, I prefer to pray five decades well than a full rosary like a parrot. There was a saint to whom someone said this, and the saint responded, Well then, pray one Hail Mary with all recollection. The person tried, but was not able to. Someone told me that St. Therese of the Child Jesus was never able to pray one Hail Mary in her entire life without distraction. The truth is that to pray a Hail Mary without distraction is no small feat. Once one is limited to praying just a single Hail Mary with difficulty, even with a certain distraction, it is better to make up for the lack of quality with quantity. If all I can do is pray Hail Marys distractedly, it is better to pray 50 Hail Marys distractedly than one Hail Mary distractedly. This is evident. Despite this deficiency, praying the rosary has great value. It is a prayer of humility. It is not presumptuous. It is free from the Protestant error of paying excessive attention to things. On the contrary, it understands human frailty and propels things forward. As a result, the repetition in the rosary is far, very far from being sterile. It has the great merit of insistence. Our Lord himself recommended, as one of the qualities of prayer, that it should be insistent. Persistent prayer obtains things. If we insist, be it just verbally, we will obtain grace. Therefore, I recommend praying the rosary as a weapon for the counter-revolutionary to persevere, to sanctify oneself, and to defeat heresies. And there you have it, his admonition to pray the full decade. While kindly written will be hard for some to accept, <laughs> that's fine. 
Um, I presented it to you today as a means of, as things seem to get worse and worse and worse in the world, that maybe we should up our game. Something for us to all think about. That we should all invest more of ourselves and our time into a life of prayer. This is why I always scratch my head when people are looking for shortcuts around devotions to living the Fatima message or looking for ways, to, shortcuts around to achieving sanctity and things in their own life. But let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.